Hello my loves, thank you for joining me on another video today. If you see me for the very first time, my name is Annie and I post true crime cases here on my channel. So if true crime is the kind of content that you enjoy, you're welcome. Consider subscribing and clicking on the notification bell so you don't miss any upload. This case I'm covering today is one of those that shows the dark side of social media. You see the social media thing? You meet people, you make friends, you don't even know the true nature of individuals. So sometimes when this relationship spills to real life, it turns very, very dark. This is the case of Cynthia Udoka Usokovu. Cynthia Udoka Osokogo was the only daughter and last child of her parents. She was born on the 10th of November 1987 in Agbo. I think Agbo is a small town in Delta State in Nigeria. Her parents were retired Major General Frank Osokogo and Joy Rita Nkem Osokogo. Cynthia came from a well-adjusted home and as a baby of the house, she was doted upon by her three older brothers, Flight Lieutenant Kenneth Utechuku Osokogo. Mr. Williams Ikiedu Osokogo and Tony Azubike Osokogo. Cynthia was a very sweet and loving, very industrious young woman, even at her very young age. As a daughter of a military personnel, she started her primary education at Command Children's School in Lauren. Then she proceeded to Command Children's Secondary School just for her secondary education. There was just absolutely nothing one would say they didn't like about Cynthia. She was just likable, you know, and just a very brilliant young girl. So she got into school quite early, and by the time she was in her teens, she got admission into Nasara State University, which is located at KP Town. KP is about, I think, 30 to 45 minutes away from the capital, Abuja. She majored in English language. Then, immediately after her compulsory national youth service, she returned back to the same institution to pursue a master's degree in public administration. This girl, Cynthia, was a true definition of an ambitious person. Or should I say, she was a go-getter. You know, she was young, she was doing quite okay for herself, but she wasn't of that mindset that, because my family is rich, I'm good. I don't have to do anything to better myself. She wasn't that kind of person. Before returning to pursue her master's degree, she had started a job at the network service provider MCN and at the same time she was pursuing a modeling career but when she decided to return to school, she quit her job and put her modeling career on the back burner and opened up a clothing boutique in the same town which she was now studying in for her second degree. She loved fashion, so having a boutique business was like being in a familiar territory, you know, she decided to name her clothing store dress code. Sometime in 2012, Cynthia, who was an active user of Facebook, got a random friend request from someone called Okumo Ichezona Mwabufo. She loved making new friends and didn't really think much about it, so she accepted his friend request. And this guy, Ichezona, then began to inbox her from time to time. He would just check up on her, like, hey, how are you doing? How is business? All that good stuff that friends do. Cynthia being Cynthia didn't see, she didn't really see any reason why she should not just respond, so she did. They got talking via Facebook Messenger for a while, then with time as the friendship progressed, each is and then told Cynthia he had a cousin called EZK who is also in the same line of business as she was. He, Echezuna, suggested that instead of going through the stress of importing inventory, he would be glad to introduce them both so that AZK would supply Cynthia her goods at a rate that was more affordable than what she was getting if she was importing. Cynthia, being the savvy businesswoman, thought it would really help. So she said, why not? Let's do it. And that was how she was formally introduced to AZK Ilochuku Ulisei Luka, the supposed cousin to Echezuna. Cynthia added him on Facebook too, and these cousins would frequently chat her and comment on her posts. In the following months, 
They gradually gained her trust and confidence and she would even eventually add them on her Blackberry. You know that time where BBM was existing, so she added them on her BBM. So now they, they have moved from Facebook to BBM. It was more like a real friendship, even though they've never met physically. These two guys who from time to time talk to Cynthia about business and this young man who seemed normal and friendly would then ask Cynthia one day, Oh, when are you coming over to Lagos next? You should come over. We'll host you whenever you decide to come and we'll also help you clear your goods. I didn't tell you that Cynthia had a relative in the United States who will sometimes send her goods. And when it arrives, she will travel down to Lagos from Kefi to clear the goods from customs and then send back the goods to Kefi to her boutique. Sometimes when she's at Lagos, she'll go to Balogun Market to purchase other inventory for dress code, the shop. She trusted her new friends enough to tell them all this information. What she didn't know at the time was that the friend request from Eche Funa was not random at all. It was a well-calculated move and these guys had been waiting patiently, stalking her every move on social media for months without her knowing. This was a time when there was no such thing as many importation as we see in this day. Anyone who had the information and know-how on importation kept it a secret. So. If you could import, you were a big deal. Cynthia was a young and very attractive girl with a booming boutique business. I think that was the reason why she became a target. They thought she was young, naive, and rich, so they could just do whatever they wanted with her. So when another batch of Cynthia's inventory arrived, she told her parents she would be traveling down to Lagos to clear her goods. She also informed her new friends in Lagos, HFN and ADK, that she was coming over to Lagos so they should be expecting her. The arrangement was for them to get the goods they promised to help her purchase at a cheaper rate ready so that when she comes, she will just check them out and see if they were a good fit for her boutique, then they can proceed from there. HFN offered to organize her trip. He told her, you know what, since you have us here now, your trip wouldn't be like before when you will come alone and stress yourself out. We're your friends and we'll host you. We'll book your hotel and come pick you up from the airport straight to your hotel room. Then we can take it up from there after you're well rested. Cynthia was so excited about this arrangement. At least she now had people who would help her run around or so she thought. On July the 20th, 2012, Cynthia flew to Lagos from Abuja. Kefi doesn't have an airport, so she traveled by road from Kefi to Abuja to board her flight to Lagos. Immediately she landed Lagos, the first person she called was her dear mother, with whom she was extremely close with. She told her she arrived safely. She was like, Mom, I have landed. I'm just waiting for my friends to come get me. I will call you again when I settle in. And her mom was like, okay, dear, please don't forget to call back. Not too long after, Ichefuna and Izuke showed up. They picked Cynthia up from the Mutala Mohammed Airport and drove her to Kosmila Hotel in Lakeview Estate, Festac Town, Lagos. Cynthia was first of all excited to meet her new friends and she was very, very grateful and super thankful that they went through all the stress to make her comfortable and feel welcome. They were like, you just came in, so relax, let's get you some refreshments, then we can talk business. Since you are not suspecting anything at all, accepted, and they offered her a drink. I think it was Ribena, yeah, it was the brand Ribena. She accepted it willingly. Unknown to her, these guys who had very bad intentions towards poor Cynthia added Rohypno. I think Rohypno is a medication that is meant for treating severe insomnia and assists with putting patients on there during surgery. So they were actually trying to knock her out and put her to sleep. So after waiting for a while, they noticed that the effect of the sedative was not fast enough, so they took on plan B. From there upwards, things escalated very fast, very quickly and very badly. You can imagine her fear and how horrified she was when she, in her very confused state of mind, she realizes that her so-called friends were actually monsters. These guys beat her severely and severely and asked her to review where she kept her money. For some reason, they just assumed that she must have come with lots of money to purchase and clear her goods and she must have also had a lot of money in her bank account since she was a very successful businesswoman.
But to their disappointment, she didn't have as much money on her as they thought she would. When they didn't get what they wanted from her, they tied her up, gagged her, and took the money they could find on her person. Then they also took her three Blackberry phones, her international passport, her jewelries, and also her driver's license. And then they left her there, just slipping in and out of consciousness until she passed away. They both spent the night with the body, and by morning, they stylishly absconded the hotel, or friended her on Facebook to remove any trace of their connection. Then they went about their business like nothing had happened. Meanwhile, back home, Cynthia's mother, Joy, unaware of what had happened to her daughter after waiting for that call Cynthia had promised, tried to reach her severally, but her phone lines were switched off. She assumed maybe Cynthia was just out of battery at first, but as she kept calling and calling and trying to reach out to no avail, she became worried and started calling her friends to find out if anyone had heard from Cynthia. Before long, everyone, family members, friends, extended family, they were all frantically trying to get a hold of Cynthia. Back at Coach Miller Hotel, things were beginning to unravel as well. So let me take you back a bit before we come back, right? So before these two guys had brought Cynthia to that hotel, the two of them had, first of all, actually checked into the hotel at about 8 a.m. that morning of July the 21st when Cynthia was due to arrive in Lagos. They had told the receptionist that they were checking out the same day. But before they could check out, the receptionist had handed over to another person after her shift was over. So she informed this new person who was taking over from her that there were two guys who were supposed to check out. The same guys then came back again, this time with Cynthia, to check her in. So when the first receptionist resumed the next morning, being the 22nd, the receptionist she had handed over to the previous day told her that the room where the two guys were checked in was still occupied. They had actually paid for just one day, so that meant that the room would expire that day, on the 22nd of July by 12 noon. The receptionist who duty it was to routinely call up rooms that were about to expire to remind them and also to know who will be checking out and those who would still like to stay called the room booked by Cynthia's friends but no one picked up the intercom. She knew three people were supposed to be in that room so it was kind of strange that the intercom was going unanswered but she didn't really read any meaning to it. But after a while Ichifuna comes downstairs from the room to inform the receptionist he was staying longer but he didn't have enough cash on him so he wanted to go use the ATM to withdraw some cash then come back to make the payment. He told the receptionist that his girlfriend was still upstairs in the room. He was actually referring to Cynthia as his girlfriend. He insisted that his girlfriend should not be disturbed under no circumstance until he gets back. The boat agreed that he will be back with the payment before the room expires at noon, right? So he goes to the ATM to get the money. Somehow, AZK, the accomplice, snuck out of the hotel that he went to the hotel bar as if he wanted to buy some drinks. Then he sneaks out of the bar pretending to be on a phone call. He met Ichifuna outside and they both left the hotel together. Fast forward to at about 3 p.m., Ichifuna calls the hotel to inform them he wasn't coming back anymore and that the hotel should remove the idiot in his room. The audacity of this man to refer to Cynthia as an idiot after what they've done to her. The receptionist who had spoken to him called the attention of the hotel manager and he decided it was best to tell the lady in the room to leave. He tried to reach the room via intercom but no one was picking up so they all went to the room and knocked severally. There was no response so after many attempts to get the attention of whoever was in that room they decided to use the master's key to open the door and there she was poor Cynthia laying lifeless without her clothes on when Cynthia was found she had her hands tied behind her with a duct tape and supported with a chain and padlock her two legs were taped together her mouth was stuffed with her hair net and a handkerchief then duct tape shut it was horrible, a very, very horrible sight to behold. The hotel management quickly alerted the police. So when the police arrived, the first and foremost requested for the CCTV footage of the hotel. It didn't take long for the two, as Ichifuna and AZK to be spotted on camera and pointed out to them by the receptionist. 
As the police began their investigations, Cynthia's body was deposited in the morgue. At this time, no one knew who she was. She wasn't identified because everything needed to identify her was taken away by the perpetrators. Meanwhile, back home, Cynthia's family and friends were getting worried. It wasn't in Cynthia's character not to have reached out to anyone for several days. Even if she didn't want to talk to anyone, Cynthia can't stay a day without talking to her mother. Joy, on the other part, kept trying and trying to get a hold of her daughter. And finally, seven days after she had last spoken with her daughter, she tried one more time and the line connected. One of the men picked up the call. I'm not sure if it was a chief now or easy K, but the person told Cynthia's mother that Cynthia was sick. Joy told them to at least put her on the phone so Cynthia can tell her exactly how sick she was by herself. That wasn't going to be possible, right? Because there was no sick Cynthia. So this person now changes the story. He says Cynthia had been kidnapped, but she was actually sick, and the sum of 20 million naira should be paid for her release. Joy at this point knew something must have happened to Cynthia, so she asked for proof of life. They said she was too sick to be put on the phone, but Cynthia's mom, she felt she was being lied to. She just knew that something was not right. Maybe something had been done to her daughter. When this news got to Cynthia's father, he immediately took action. As a retired general, he was able to pull some string quickly and the call was traced to the first stack area of Lagos. A missing persons report was submitted to the police command in Festac, and an investigation commenced with full force immediately. At this time, the police had not linked the case of the body found at the hotel to the missing persons report. But as soon as it was known that a young girl was found in a hotel and the body had been deposited at a morgue, Cynthia's family were able to get there and they identified the body as Cynthia. She was eventually released to her family later on and she was laid to rest at her country home in Boji Boji, Hawaii, not local government area of Delta State. So an autopsy was performed on the body and according to autopsy reports, there were pinpoint uh, holes, that is tiny, tiny holes in the white part of Cynthia's eyes. Inside the upper part of her airways and on the surface of her lungs, I think it's something called petechial hemorrhage. I'm not sure, but I think that's what it's called. It was also revealed that she had pulmonary edema, which meant that her lungs soaked up so much body fluid, they were now overweight. She also had multiple bruises and abrasions suspected to be bite marks, so it was concluded that her COD was asphyxiation. It didn't take long for these two monsters to be apprehended. Through the help of the CCTV footage and cell phone records, the police were able to track them down and arrest both of them. More than two persons were actually arrested at the beginning of the investigations. This included Ezeke Olise Loka, who was 23 years old at the time, Ichi Funa Okonongwa Bufo, who was 33 years old at the time, and there were the major players, right? Then there was also the pharmacist who sold them the Rohypno. His name was Osita Oji, and then there was Nonso Olise Loka, who was the brother to Ezeke. He had assisted in selling Cynthia's Blackberry phones. Both the pharmacist and Nonso were later on acquitted of any crimes. In the course of the trial, 10 witnesses were called to testify and 17 exhibits tendered. Several other women came forward to reveal that they had been sedated and tied up and robbed by the suspect. They actually operated like a gang that specialized in luring or suspecting young women and taking away their possessions before doing away with them. Although it was speculated and rumored that their motives were ritualistic, it looks more like a thing of pure greed. Cynthia was not their first target, but she certainly was the very last. The case dragged on for a while, but finally, five years later, at the end of the trial, both men, Echefuna and Ezeke, got the capital punishment. Cynthia's case exposed the dark side of social media. A place where people are supposed to meet people and probably make new friends, you know, learn from each other. But her case was different. It turned out to be what brought her to her very end. Are things like this still happening? Absolutely. You never believe something like this can happen to you or someone you know until it actually does. So being careful is what we should all do. With that being said, 
that's all I have for today's video guys. Let's live and learn from Cynthia's case. Learn to be more vigilant and observant in the friendships we make online. Kindly subscribe to my channel if you like this video and give this video a thumbs up. Turn on the notification so that you don't miss any of my uploads. Until next video, take care of you and yours.